Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm really pleased today to be reintroducing our project, U.S. Budget Watch, which is something that we started last campaign season. Uh, the purpose of this project is clearly to, to focus on the important fiscal impacts of campaign promises as the campaign unfolds. Um, and last time around, it was a big success in that um, it was heralded by CNN as um, the most detailed analysis of McCain and Obama's budget plans. We're coming from the nonpartisan committee for the responsible federal budget. That's exactly what we want. We want the focus of this to be to look at all the campaign promises that get made throughout the campaign through a nonpartisan lens uh, and just look at the bottom line, how they affect the deficit and debt. And so today what we are unveiling is our uh, first major policy report of this campaign, primary numbers, the GOP candidate and the national debt. Um, and the project, I should really clarify, because it's so important during heated campaigns, emphatically nonpartisan. Our board of directors, many of whom are here today and will be talking on our panel about this, um, are the leading budget experts in the country. They have led CBO, OMB, the Treasury Department, the Fed, the Budget Committees, um, and all of them that look at this from either a nonpartisan or a partisan perspective on fiscal responsibility, but we come together as an organization and don't think about this through a political lens at all. And so that is really our number one commitment to bring the numbers out, make them transparent, provide something for voters to use during a campaign where this issue is obviously going to be critically important. Let me also tell you what this project is not. Um, today's report is not the end of the story. One of the important things to know is that all the campaigns are continuing to develop uh, and fill in and alter their proposals as they go along. And this will be kind of a living, breathing document as the campaign proceeds. We will update the numbers. We will fill them in. We will work with the campaigns. We were really pleased last time around that the way this worked is we sat down with the campaigns, with their advisors, went through the numbers, understood all of them, tried to create a very useful voter guide, and also, when asked, gave ideas on what things affect fiscal policies in different ways. So we look at ourselves as a resource uh, as well as something that provides information for voters. It's certainly not the end of the story, though, and we will be providing other um, policy reports. For instance, one thing we don't do in this report, we don't look at the long-term effects of all the policy promises. And clearly, because of the fiscal situation, things like Social Security reform, Medicare reform, which would likely be phased in more gradually, are critically important to the fiscal health of the country. And so we'll issue another report down the road on the long-term effects, how the uh, fiscal promises would affect things beyond the eight-year. We, we look at all of these numbers kind of in a two-term presidential period. So beyond the eight years, what would this look like? Another thing that this project is not is it's not just a mouthpiece for the campaigns. So as I said, we do look closely to what they've put out, what their policies are, how they describe them, but we really go to the impartial sources uh, to get the score. So we look at what CBO has said, the Congressional Budget Office, Joint Tax Committee, GAO, importantly, the Tax Policy Center, which is a nonpartisan tax center run by Brookings and Urban and really provides invaluable resources both for this report and beyond in terms of scoring the tax policies for campaigns. So we talk to the campaigns about their own numbers and then we also go beyond and bring to you what the scores from those outside experts are. And in many cases we have to come up with our own scores from our models as well. So we're very transparent where these all come from. Um, and for that reason we also have different scores based on low debt, medium debt and high debt scenarios. We'll talk about those in just a second. Finally, what this also is not is a comparison to President Obama. Uh, we will do that. We will look at how the Republican nominee and President Obama's plans look um, and go through all of them together. But right now, we thought it was important to recognize that in the Republican primary, in the, in the primary, the work's not finished yet. We will continue, as we did yesterday, to see new proposals coming out of the different campaigns, just like the Romney campaign came out with some new tax proposals yesterday. We'll update those and we'll bring President Obama's numbers into this picture. We do do an analysis of the President's budget, things like that, but what we will bring is an apples to apples comparison when the time is right because it is, it is fair and important to recognize that the Republicans are still building out their proposals. So what this is, is it's our best analysis, our best attempt to make transparent the promises the campaigns have made. I mean, one very useful resource is you can just go through this report and see what all the policies on the tax and spending side that have been promised, what they are, um, and to look at those overall effects on the bottom line. 
So before I jump into the meat of what they've given, what they've put out, I do want to make um, two very special thank yous to our project director, Jeff Anke, who has run this uh, entire project and really done a phenomenal job of digging into every policy. He's not here today with us because he's vacationing with his family, well deserved after many, many long nights of this. Um, but he's been invaluable and is new to the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Um, and our ever critical important policy director, Mark Goldwine, who has shepherded this project along with so many others for the committee and really just knows these numbers, knows these policies, and knows the economics behind them better than anybody else. So thank you so much to the two of them and all the other staff at the committee who've put together this great report. So I now want to move on to the policies. If we have somebody who's moving the slides. Oh, is it me? It's me. <laughs> well, we might not be able to move on. Let's see. Okay. So uh, just to back up a little bit, and anybody who's come to committee events before is sort of familiar with our um, un un unwavering focus on this important issue, but why does it matter so much? Um, obviously, the country's debt is nearing historical levels. It's well beyond the historical average, which was below 40% of GDP, and it's headed in a dangerous d direction. Undeniably, it's now on a path which would result in a fiscal crisis if we're not to make changes. So what we decided to do was look at the debt levels. Debt is so important for how markets respond, the economic effects um, of the fiscal situation of the country, to look at how the debt levels would change over that eight year, roughly eight year period for each of the candidates' promises. And we start with what we call the CRFB, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget's realistic baseline. What we do is we assume that all of the tax cuts would be extended. This isn't our policy preferences. It's just the realistic base beginning point to compare things against. So we assume that all of the tax policies would be extended, the tax cuts, excuse me, would be extended. We assume that as it has been in the past, the alternative minimum tax would be patched. The doc fix or sustainable growth rate uh, uh, part of Medicare would be patched. We assume the drawdown of the warm wars. Um, and finally, we assume that the um, sequester would not go into place. And that is our starting point against which we compare all of the policies. In terms of how we make those comparisons, there are, really, there are three scenarios, uh, and they are based on three critical differences. But we have low debt, intermediate debt, and high debt. And the differences are based on these three critical things. One, which is the level of specificity of any policy. We score it very differently if somebody says, we will cut spending, or we will cut spending by doing X, Y, and Z. Because of course, uh, it's great to talk about cutting spending and cutting the deficit. And the hard part of all of this is being willing to get specific and allowing the country to have a discussion about the trade-offs inherent in all of this. Uh, and there's so much talk this election about out of this all coming a, fisc a mandate on what to do about fiscal policy. I have no idea whether that will be the result of this election. I suppose I could see realistically, um, as much as there being a mandate for how to fix our budget situation, there being plenty of promises about what not to do. I won't cut spending. I won't uh, raise taxes. I won't do any of the things that ultimately will have to be done to fix the situation. Um, and we think it's important to recognize that the more specific a candidate is, getting, is willing to be about how they would get something done, the more likely it is to actually take place. Because again, it's a lot easier to say, I would cut spending by X trillion dollars than to specify how that would happen. So we recognize those differences in the different debt scenarios. Uh, secondly, we look at differences between scoring of those outside credible sources, which I mentioned, CBO, Joint Tax, the Tax Policy Center, and the candidates own scores. So if there is a difference in how they estimate something would save, uh, how much it would save, usually the estimate is that it would save more than those outside sources, um, and an estimate that comes from other places, we recognize those in the different scenarios as well, giving candidates credit for their own scores in the low debt scenario, but not the others. Um, finally, if the pr policy parameters are left vague, for instance, what would be the timing of phasing something in, then we recognize those different scenarios and play out the different debt uh, situations. So in general, we're going to give them more credit the more specific they are. Uh, two other things just to take note of that we don't do. We aren't able to capture any effects of long-term proposals, as I mentioned, when they come in this window of time. We will look at other, um, we will look through other reports at the effects of long-term reforms. It's critically important that those be recognized. But in standard budget scoring and in the way we do this, they don't show up in a short term unless you actually make those changes within the first decade or so. Uh, so we weren't able to capture those here. <clears throat> 
Secondly, true to convention, the way that CBO and joint tax score things, we don't look at macro dynamic effects of tax policies. So when you lower tax rates, uh, it may well contribute to economic growth. That isn't captured in the scores that we use. We do, however, look at the micro dynamic effects, the behavioral effects. So it does have effects when people change tax policy and people's behavior. That's captured, but the overall dynamic effects are not. I'm sure that the campaigns will say they're uh, tax proposals would generate economic growth, and that in, all, in many cases is true, but it's not captured in the way that we do scoring conventionally, and so we, we reflect those conventions for scoring. This is just a quick summary of the deficits under all of the candidates' proposals. Um, I would note uh, there's a lot of talk about balancing the budget, sort of the last cycle of fiscal responsibility. That was the objective, to balance the budget. Um, I would point out that none of the candidates balance the budget, and nor is the budget ever balanced under our, um, our uh, realistic baseline um, in the year that this is captured. And that's, reali that's reality. Unfortunately, we're not in a place where it's likely the budget's going to be balanced um, in the near term, unless there's very high levels of economic growth, which would be uh, tremendously helpful, but we shouldn't count on them. And so we think that this is helpful to understand the differences between the candidates, but also to understand that really the focus of most of this is on how you get the debt to a manageable level. And one of the things we've talked about through the at the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget is how you get the debt to where it's not growing faster than the economy overall. And that's one of the metrics a lot of people want to focus on. So let's just quickly go through the um, individual candidates, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to talk more about fiscal issues in campaigns. First, we'll look at uh, candidate Gingrich. And so what you see under the three scenarios, and, and I'm going to focus on the middle line and the intermediate debt scenario, since that's the one that sort of reflects the balance between those three different levels of specificity and policy parameters and the campaign's estimates that we think is, is the best one to focus on. If you compare where we're headed under a realistic baseline, um, at this end of this time period, the debt is likely to be 85% of GDP. Under Gingrich's proposals, the debt would increase by $7 trillion compared to that amount, and the debt levels would reach 114% of GDP. Um, now, clearly there are ranges. It could be uh, higher or lower than that, but actually under all of the scenarios, by our projections from the policies so far, it would increase the debt rather significantly. Uh, you all have the report, and the report is posted online right now, or about to be, uh, both at usbudgetwatch.org and crfb.org. So you can pull up the report there if you're um, watching this on television rather than in person. But as you can see in the report, we'll go through all the specific policies. But just to focus on a couple of the major ones from Candidate Gingrich, um, the largest tax policies, which would lose revenue in this case, um, are a two-tiered tax system, an alternative tax of 15% as a flat tax, uh, which would have a significant effect on the bottom line. And second, a reduction in corporate taxes um, down to 12.5% top rate, which is um, a significant cut. In terms of the spending, most of the savings under this plan come from block granting Medicaid and eliminating or cutting a about 100 other means-tested programs. Um, and there's also reforms to Social Security of implementing private accounts, which is something that would have more savings over time, but in the short run, because it diverts money into the Social Security accounts, is extremely costly. On candidate Paul. Overall, we find that he would actually reduce the debt compared to our um, standardized baseline by $2.2 trillion, and that the debt levels compared to our 85% starting point would come down to 76% of GDP at the end of the two terms that we're looking at. In the range as well, there's only one scenario, the high debt scenario, where he would actually increase the debt. But generally, the debt comes down. Um, and he does have tax policies that cut taxes, both in um, costly tax cuts on uh, the income tax, which actually he would rather repeal um, and make unconstitutional. But in the interim, he, he just gets rid of a lot of components of the income tax, um, reduces corporate taxes as well. Um, but he's very specific in the spending cuts uh, that he would look at. He would eliminate a number of agencies, specific cuts that he identifies out there, um, make block grants, cut defense. And you go through all the spending cuts, and in most cases, we find that that would outweigh his tax cuts. Okay, 
Moving on to candidate Romney. Romney's plan, um, and this is one of the things the campaign has said that they uh, intend to do, but we find it's basically deficit neutral. Um, now, again, there's a huge range, but overall, in the intermediate situation, uh, we find that it would just be a, a marginal increase of $250 billion. It's not really a marginal number, but over 10 years, um, certainly due to scoring. It's basically deficit neutral. Um, and that the range, uh, depending on how the tax plan would work, we're just filling in the new details, and we will actually update this proposal for many of the new details that came out yesterday from the campaign about their new tax proposal. Um, but he offers a number of reforms to the tax code, including income and corporate. Uh, many of these are offset, particularly by base broadening efforts. Um, and on the spending side, similar to some of the other proposals, there'd be block grants, cuts in the workforce, cuts in domestic discretionary spending, um, and we were told that there will be more in entitlement reform, which again will probably be more affecting the long term. Um, so the range here is that it could basically be deficit neutral, uh, go down to as low as 75% of GDP by the end of the period, or up as high as 94% of GDP. But this range is pretty much tighter than a number of the others that we've seen. Then finally, um, candidate Santorum's proposal. So there's major cuts, um, again, in income taxes and corporate taxes under this proposal, uh, and they would have um, a negative effect on the overall deficit impact. At the same time, um, the candidate does have a significant emphasis on entitlement reform, and in fact is the only candidate that actually starts to make some of these changes within the window. So you start to see these changes become phased in uh, earlier on, and they're starting to be more specific about what they would look like. Like other candidates, you also see block grants. Um, candidate Santorum talks about freezing um, defense, um, and he identifies a number of other cuts. There's the, the biggest issue here is that he talks about cutting $5 trillion from spending, but doesn't get specific about where that $5 trillion would come from. And so the numbers are highly dependent on whether you score that as a cut or not. And again, so we looked at that and we scored that as a cut in our low debt scenario, not the other two. And it's a tremendous difference between cutting the overall uh, deficits over that period compared to our baseline by just over two and a half trillion dollars compared to adding to them of four and a half trillion dollars. So one of the things we'll see is whether it becomes more specific how you'd fill in that five trillion in cuts, which would obviously have a very strong impact on the bottom line. The range here um, is that in the low debt scenario, debt would end at 74 percent of GDP. High debt scenario, it's up as high as 107 percent of GDP. So again, we'll, that will be the biggest kind of uh, thing to watch for whether those five trillion get filled out. So what I'd like to do now is people can have time to look a little bit at the report. We can talk more specifically about all the proposals. Again, I think one of the real benefits of this report is it's a voter guide. You now have something where you can look at each candidate and see what specific proposals they've made on the tax side to corporate taxes, to income taxes, to payroll taxes, and on the spending side. What have they said about defense? How would they cap discretionary if they would? Uh, what specific programs have they put out for elimination? What things would they spend more money on? Um, of course, there's some things that people will spend more money on as well. So you have a voter guide. You have a range of the estimates for the savings or costs that they would all provide. You're able from there to look at the bottom line. I really recommend that everybody understand this is a living, breathing document and it will change as the campaigns go forward. Um, and in many cases, the details will be filled out and the campaigns will provide more information. There may be more savings, there may be less, and we will continue to update these. But I think it's really useful, really important, and we hope um, uh, beneficial to people to have a resource an impartial, non-partisan non resource that's going to look at the cost of these proposals, that's going to look at the bottom line, and that's going to keep the focus on specifics during a campaign that we know is going to have a lot of discussion about fiscal responsibility. Uh, and here is a way to sort of look at how those numbers add up. So I'm very pleased that we have three of our board members here today, if, if you all would come up. Um, we're joined today by three board members from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Both Vic Fazio and Bill Frenzel are former members of Congress, different sides of the aisle, uh, both very committed to fiscal responsibility from where they sit. And of course, there's Alice Rivlin, who has headed Congressional Budget Office, the Office of Management and Budget. She's been the Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and we're so thrilled um, 
to have them involved in the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget and to have them with us today to lead us in a discussion about the fiscal issues in this report, but more broadly, uh, how during campaign season we talk about fiscal policy and how during specifically this critical campaign uh, we think the issues of fiscal policy are going to unfold, what we expect to see, what may happen afterwards. Everything's open. So I look forward to their comments and then we'll have a rich discussion with the audience. So thanks again for joining us today. Alice, would you kick us off, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, let me stress that my views are mine only uh, and not uh, those of any of the organizations with which I'm associated, including this one. I think the con uh, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has done a really signal service uh, to the press, uh, the public, and to the candidates. The proposals at this stage of any campaign are understandably not totally spelled out. Uh, and you can't imagine how hard uh, analysts have to work to figure out what these proposals actually are and how they would impact the budget. Uh, the dense footnotes in this document will give you a clue uh, as to how hard uh, the staff worked uh, to make these uh, estimates. But there is admittedly much uncertainty at this stage. Alternative assumptions, as Maya has uh, pointed out, uh, are, are necessary. And some of the proposals are not primarily uh, budgetary. Uh, my favorite one, wearing my old uh, Federal Reserve hat, uh, is Ron Paul's proposal uh, to end the Federal Reserve. What's the impact of that on the budget? Well, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve actually makes money for the Treasury, so you can say it saves money, but think about it. Uh, if this great nation, uh, the largest economy in the world, didn't have a central bank, uh, what would happen? Well, none of us know, uh, but uh, uh, the impact on the budget uh, would be likely to be uh, major, but uh, it's inherently um, unscorable. Now, it's too much at this stage uh, to ask candidates uh, to uh, pr uh, give you finished proposals with all the uh, details. It's not too uh, much to ask that they be fiscally uh, responsible. Uh, and so I think the questions are the ones that the committee put out as principles uh, early, uh, earlier this year, uh, and they boil down to uh, do the candidates uh, recognize that the United States budget is on an unsustainable track and that we must take steps to stabilize uh, the debt? As Maya pointed out, the new definition is can we get the new definition of responsibility is can we get the debt to a point where it is not ra rising faster? Uh, than uh, the economy is growing. That is a real common sense uh, definition. Uh, we don't have to balance the budget. Uh, we just have to get back to a situation uh, in which at least uh, the debt is not rising faster than the economy because anybody, whatever your uh, ideology or viewpoint about economics, can recognize that a country whose debt is growing faster than its economy can possibly grow is in deep trouble, and that's uh, where uh, we are. Uh, are they making proposals that uh, make uh, that risk making the debt problem worse? Well, uh, that's, uh, that is, I think, a major uh, question. And are they proposing things that might actually be expected to happen? Now, I am a veteran of two very, two of the many, very serious bipartisan efforts uh, to uh, rein in the debt. So I believe that 
there is no solution to this stabilizing the debt problem that does not involve bending the cost curve in health care, reining in the cost of health care entitlements, putting Social Security back on a sound track, and raising more revenue from a reformed tax system. Now, I don't expect Republicans uh, to propose raising taxes, but it seems to me that one definition of responsibility is, can you reform the tax system? Are you proposing to reform the tax system in whatever way you think uh, is best uh, that at least doesn't make uh, the situation worse? And on that score, all of these candidates fail. Uh, they all reduce the revenue available uh, to uh, the U.S. government over over time. Why is that irresponsible? Because I think it's not realistic to think that we're going to absorb this tsunami of seniors and their need for health care uh, with the revenues uh, that uh, uh, we are on uh, track uh, to have. Um, so I would, uh, I would uh, give them uh, low marks on that score. Uh, they don't make, many of them, uh, serious proposals on the entitlements and uh, uh, on the health entitlements and Social Security that can be scored in this window and as Maya, this limited eight-year window, and as Maya has pointed out, uh, that's uh, not terribly um, surprising. Uh, but uh, why is this a service to the candidates? I think it really is. Uh, it is saying to the candidates from a nonpartisan group, uh, what you say matters. And this report doesn't have all the scoring answers, but uh, its main contribution, I think, is going to make the candidates think, am I really proposing something uh, that I could do as president? Uh, or uh, and am I saying something responsible about it? Uh, and that's a big service. Now, I expect that in the next week, uh, Maya's going to get angry phone calls from absolutely all these campaigns. Uh, she, they're going to say, you didn't understand what we were, what we were saying, and uh, you didn't uh, give proper credit for this or for that. That's terrific. Uh, <laughs> That means they're paying attention uh, and uh, that uh, the staff here may have to correct some of the numbers, may have to change some of the assumptions, uh, but it will start a conversation in a realistic realm uh, that has not been going on before. Thank you. Before I turn it over, I just want to say a particular thank you for that sort of voice of reality of how something like this works, which is it's never going to be perfect. None of the numbers are ever going to be perfect. None of the best scores in the whole city can ever get all this perfect. And the focus is to put it out there, to add positive pressure, to do the right thing, to say that people are watching the effects of these promises. We know promises are made in campaigns. And we also do know how hard it is. It's hard to go out there and talk about the real policies that would change the tax code, uh, particularly those that would raise revenues, that would reduce spending, particularly those that are specific. Um, and in some ways, perhaps this can lend a countervailing force, where when people talk about the tough choices that are required, they're going to get a positive score for doing so. Um, and so it will never be perfect. We know that. And I'm going to forward those calls to Alice, because I think she'd be great at <laughs> helping explain why it's a service if there's lots of angry, angry candidates. Um, but Alice really has spent so much time in different administrations, in different roles, and knows all the different sides of budgeting, um, and is, as a result, a true national fiscal hero on all of this. So thank Thank you, Alice. Bill. Thank you, Maya, and thank you, Alice. Thanks to all of you for coming. <clears throat> the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, we've always worked hard to inform the American people about the fiscal promises made by politicians and to make sure that those politicians spell out the promises in as much detail as we can get from them. <clears throat> this particular uh, analysis, the uh, primary numbers uh, book that you received today is an important but uh, only a very initial first look at what the Republican candidates, and we'll get to uh, President Obama later, 
uh, propose to get the budget back in shape. As the candidates uh, flesh out their plans, as Maya indicated, we'll be releasing uh, uh, future studies. Uh, the uh, 212 campaign, uh, which we have begun now, comes at a, at a crucial budget time. Uh, it has been explained, uh, the, uh, our uh, deficit and debt uh, trajectory uh, going forward uh, takes us uh, uh, well above uh, any kind of reasonable uh, ratio between debt and GDP. Uh, currently somewhere north of 70 percent and, and headed up toward 100, uh, depending on how these, uh, the people who are elected in this election uh, react. Our target has been uh, somewhere around 60 percent of GDP to be achieved within a decade, uh, and then, of course, uh, trying to lower it to somewhere near the post-war average so that uh, we would at least be in shape to handle uh, emergencies uh, in, that may come along in the future. Uh, candidates uh, in this uh, election uh, can uh, work on the budget issues and they can show us uh, exactly how they intend to deal with them. Uh, or uh, in some cases, uh, they may not. They may simply uh, shout slogans uh, at us or at one another. Vic and I have been through this process a few times, and in the heat of battle, uh, sometimes detail uh, uh, gets lost. And, uh, but we're going to uh, do the best we can to be sure that uh, we bring it all to you. And we hope that uh, every American understands that you can't solve the problem by cutting uh, what we call improper payments or fraud, waste, and abuse. We can't uh, solve the problem by eliminating foreign aid or lowering congressional salaries. We have to be specific and we have to concentrate on the spending and tax problems uh, that are putting us uh, into the position we're now in. There are real ways to get back on track. Uh, probably won't, we won't hear a lot of them in the primary campaign, but as we get into the general, uh, we're going to be looking more at process reform and more at details. And process, of course, has always been a favorite subject for the Committee for a Responsible uh, Federal Budget. One of those process reforms is closer attention to a long-term budget. Uh, I've described uh, some of our problems, and uh, Maya has indicated that particularly in health care and certain other entitlements, uh, the long-term uh, difficulties uh, need to be looked at and have to be assessed even as we work on our short-term budgets. We have to start budgeting for the long-term with special attention to Social Security, health care, and revenues. In the shorter term, we have to set goals and, and establish targets to get that deficit, uh, to get that debt down to 60 percent, to stabilize that debt, and push it down on a declining path. Rules aren't the final answer uh, because Congress has proved itself willing to break all of its rules. Uh, but rules help, and they point the finger at those who are reneging on the promises. In the long term, we need to aim to balance the budget. It'll take time. You've seen in uh, Maya's uh, slides uh, that uh, none of the uh, primary promisers on the Republican side get us to a balanced budget in 10 years, uh, even uh, in the most optimistic estimates uh, of what they are talking about. It will take time, but we have to get there, and it needs to be a goal of ours. Any of these uh, candidates that we are analyzing today, or the president, is going to face a tough four-year uh, period uh, coming on. Nobody expects a miraculous recovery. We can't recover. Uh, it's going to take uh, decades. Nevertheless, if we don't start now, it's going to be uh, impossible. Nobody knows where the tipping point will come. Uh, all we know is it will come, and when it comes, it will come suddenly and relentlessly. Uh, 
the miraculous recovery is going to take a long time. Uh, fiscal sobriety exists only at the end of a long and difficult road. And finally, in addition to a concrete plan for spending and taxing, we should be thinking about the processes that got us into this mess and resolve to try to avoid them as we move forward. It's easy for the politicians to make promises. Uh, again, the rules are going to figure importantly in the final solutions. They won't save us, but they'll give, be a great help to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vic. Thank you, Maya. It's a great honor to be on a panel with Alice and Bill. Um, perhaps I need to make a particular disclaimer, given the fact that I've had a fairly uh, well-known partisan Democratic background as a member of Congress. Um, my ability to sit here and judge objectively Republicans running for president may be called into question. But I do so as a member of this body because I think um, under Maya's leadership, we brought together a fairly broad-based uh, bipartisan group of members who come from different points on the political spectrum, but all of whom believe that deficits and debt are an important issue that has to be addressed. And so as I began to review the proposals made by these four candidates, I'd look to this organization's 12 principles of fiscal responsibility uh, that they hope to be injected into the debate in this campaign as a, as a way of going about analyzing what has been put before the voters, certainly in the primary states that have been engaged so far. First of all, I think the top priority is to make deficit reduction a priority. And I think we all know the path we're on is unsustainable. We've heard a good deal from these candidates about cutting spending. But in fact, as Maya's charts showed you earlier, not much progress. In fact, some significant harm is done to fight in the way these candidates have made proposals in the effort to reduce spending and reduce debt and to get deficits on a trajectory downward instead of upward. This is partly driven by tax proposals that are largely uh, driven in the direction of cutting further. At the same time in our history, we have an historically low rate of taxation per GDP. I think we're in the 15 to 16 percent range, spending in the 23 to 24 percent range. That gap has to close. Most, if not all, of these tax proposals would widen it. Spending cuts, as we all know, are easy to talk about in theory, but in reality and in detail, they lose a lot of their political luster. Candidates are uh, loath to get into the details about spending cuts. And so as I looked at some of the proposals that have been made, a couple of them jumped out at me, not, not as a partisan, but as a budgeteer. Newt's talking about this a block grant and cutting spending on 100 plus federal programs that are means tested, saving $2.4 uh, billion, dollars, uh, pardon me, trillion dollars over time. This is a, a very nice idea, but the reality has to be made explicit for the average voter to understand what programs are being discussed. There's a general uh, category of spending called reducing improper payments. All of these candidates seem to have found a way to save $160 um, uh, trillion, dollars, uh, you know, <laughs> over periods of, of 10 years. This is a huge amount of money uh, and is a, frankly, undecipherable way of going about uh, making reductions. Uh, Ron Paul talks about ending wars and reducing uh, non-defense spending by huge amounts of money, which are completely unavailable um, in any detail. Uh, there's no question that cutting federal workforce costs may be a wonderful concept, but the idea that uh, Mr. Romney and Mr. Santorum and others have put out in that regard is completely untethered to some sort of specific fiscal reality. There's no detail. 
and that detail is what the voters deserve. Uh, it's also important that we not perpetuate the budget myths. A number of men have been mentioned in the past here. Deficits and debt don't matter. I don't think we're hearing that myth much anymore. We haven't heard it really for uh, perhaps five or six years. It was often cited during the last administration. Tax cuts pay for themselves. Well, I think as uh, Maya indicated earlier, there's no question that there is some economic growth based on some tax cut proposals, but to have dynamic scoring become a uh, underpinning of how we go about reducing deficits by making uh, people believe that tax cuts are actually going to help grow the economy is a canard and it can't be uh, abided with. Uh, there are those who say cutting waste, fraud, and abuse will solve all our problems. We like to put a plug in for that kind of savings. It's illusory. It never actually is ever scorable. It's a nice phrase. President Reagan made it very popular. David Stockman, who's part of this organization, would tell you uh, how often uh, they came up short in really finding the waste, fraud, and abuse that had been discussed. Another one that's really taken on a life of its own is earmarks. There is absolutely no way in which earmarks, if totally eliminated, would reduce spending. Earmarks are a carve out of what the administration's budget would propose. And of course, foreign aid is on everyone's list for elimination but every president usually fights for more spending in this category. We talked about uh, doing an end to nation building. Uh, that was a very important plank in the prior administration's uh, proposals going forward, but of course we've spent billions on nation building in the interim. Medicare and Social Security on the left are often cited as programs that are earned benefits and their need, uh, therefore need to sit um, by themselves and not be included in this debate. I think we all realize that they have to be on the table and they have to be reined in. And there is no way that they cannot be fundamental to deficit reduction going forward. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And candidates, more often than not, perpetuate the myth that somehow these kinds of spending cuts, five trillion dollars over five years as Rick Santorum has advocated, have no downside, have no cost. The other thing I think we need to do is refrain from pledges. I want to congratulate uh, Steve LaTourette of Ohio for calling for a bonfire of pledges. He wants to bring all the pledges that all or organizations from left to right require of members who run in party primaries and general elections to sign. They are the greatest impediment to bringing about the kind of bipartisan solutions that I think we all know will be required if we are to get our debt and deficit on the downward trajectory. So I, I want to encourage Congress and the administration and the candidates running on the Republican side to get real over the next six to eight months. Everyone talks about the train wreck that could occur in a lame duck session of this Congress, when in fact a number of policies are going to be required to, have to be dealt with, including the tax cuts that uh, would terminate. There is a lot of leverage on both sides. A, a good deal of policy needs to be engaged in. Bill and I were talking earlier about the possibility of just a kick the can down the road scenario in the lame duck session, but it won't be long before the next president and the Congress have to grapple with these issues. So the more specificity, the more willingness to be honest about what needs to be done that can occur in the context of this election will make it that much easier for policymakers to find the solutions that are absolutely essential to get us to where we need to go, which is, as Alice said earlier, not, not a matter of, of, of balancing budgets, but just getting our trajectory in line with the economic growth of the country. So with that, I would uh, be interested, as I'm sure the other panelists are, in discussing some of these in more detail with you. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, that was just spot on. And there, there are two themes I want to draw out that um, 
most, if not all of you mentioned. The first is on specifics and the second is on the long term. Um, so it's interesting. So Vic, you, you sort of said some of the specifics you didn't find um, to be realistic. Uh, and I actually think I'm a little bit more uh, charitable or sensitive to how hard it is to get specific, which is why on this low debt scenario we went ahead and we gave all the candidates credit for places even where they weren't specific. But if you say you're going to cap spending at 20 percent of GDP, or you say you're going to cut $5 trillion, yes, we think you should be specific. But also, I think, Alice, you pointed out, it's very difficult to expect them to be that specific at this point in the campaign, one, because of the political reality of how you are going to get beaten up for it, and two, they're just getting started. They don't have a full government institution kind of backing them, giving them all the support, scoring their plans like a sitting president does. It's very difficult to pull together all of these proposals. And when you look at our low debt scenario, uh, one of the things that I was actually quite encouraged to see is that um, three of the four candidates bring the debt down to below where we expect to see it on our realistic baseline. So it doesn't bring it down to where it needs to be, um, but it's actually a start in the right direction. So part of this is a judgment call for anybody to make for how specific they think they should be. But I guess the question I wanted to ask the panelists is, what can we expect in terms of specifics right now um, in a campaign? How do you balance the political reality, particularly during a primary, with the need to create a mandate so that going forward, when whoever is in office and is ready to govern can actually look back at what they promised and say, well, I told the people and they, they gave me the vote of confidence in voting for me. So how do you balance those two? Jump in. Alice. Well, I think there are two things. Uh, one is how specific uh, do they get? but uh, And there uh, you can expect them to at least give you examples of what they're talking about, uh, vague notions of five trillion dollars, which means almost nothing to anybody, uh, are, uh, are, I think, not responsible. Uh, but the other thing is, I think you have to l expect that they would look at whether in the aggregate uh, impact of their proposal is realistic. Uh, I said, I don't think that cutting revenues further uh, is a responsible thing to do, and they all do it. But I don't think cutting discretionary spending, whether specifically or not, uh, way below where it is under the cuts that have already been un undertaken uh, is a realistic view of what uh, the American public uh, wants. Uh, and then, if you're proposing it, then you have to say, well, what are we really going to do? about federal prisons and air traffic control and national parks and all of those things uh, uh, within this total, which is so much lower uh, than anything we've had before. You know, as an appropriator, I can say uh, these freezes that we've already put in place have yet to be felt. The details are still to be determined by Congress's not yet elected even. And so I think, as Alice says, cutting domestic discretionary spending is a lot easier to do in general than it is in detail. And the public will recoil to some degree from a number of the cuts that would be made in programs they care a lot about. These cuts will have to be made. But to just layer additional cuts on top of those that have already been called for is going to be a lot more difficult than anyone can imagine, including many members of Congress who haven't been uh, given the opportunity to sit on the committees that actually have to make these choices. But the details are important, and we need to get beyond the glittering generalities and talk about specific departments and agencies and functions of government that will need to be reduced. That's an important level of honesty that the voters really deserve to hear. But as Alice implies, it's the entitlement programs and the revenue side that have to be addressed. And they have to be addressed by both parties, and they have to be addressed honestly, because I believe, ultimately, there will be more consensus than you can imagine in this kind of hot political environment that we're involved with right now. Yeah, I think that, uh, that in the primary session, it's, uh, it gets to be a, sort of a bidding match between the candidates as to who's going to do 
I'm going to cut more, or I'm going to cut taxes more. But I think it is not a season in which uh, we expect uh, or are going to get uh, the kind of specificity uh, that uh, we are going to insist on in the general election campaign. I think when the Republicans uh, select their candidate, uh, then the, uh, the face-off between President Obama and the Republican candidate, we will have uh, <coughs> much better luck in demanding specifics uh, from the uh, from the two of them, and uh, obviously it will be uh, uh, Democrats uh, trying to defend entitlements and Republicans uh, trying to defend against tax increases. Uh, that's to be expected. Uh, the final solution, which most of us here believe has to include uh, both revenues and uh, entitlements, uh, we hope will be some sort of a synthesis that, that only the politicians can negotiate between themselves. Bill is more optimistic about the specifics of the general election uh, than I think uh, we have a right to be given the past history. Um, that's interesting. I keep thinking that wouldn't it be great if in the general election, because I do think there's a chance that we'll get more specific there, because I think this issue is not going away. It's on the voters' mind. I, my observation is that voters are actually well ahead of politicians in this, and that they would welcome kind of the, the realistic laying out of what it's going to take to fix this problem. But I suppose there are many smart pollsters who would say I'm, I'm wrong. Um, but I just keep thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a debate in the general where we basically laid up the question of, to the two main candidates, how would you save the four to six trillion dollars that all the outside experts have said is necessary to stabilize the debt? Specifically, come to the debate and say how you would save that money and actually require that they lay out the kind of plan that we're talking about here. It seems less far-fetched to me in this um, election than in the ones past that that could happen because there's so much focus on the issue. I Did think you? they would probably decline They would the not debate. show up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they might, but let me make another point about what they might say if they did. Uh, it would be important to recognize that in that situation, both candidates would know that they were entering a negotiation and they would not be expected to put a final solution to say, how far would you go on this mm -hmm. or that? Uh, they could only be expected to say, uh, here's our opening offer. This is what my opening bid would be if I were president. And I think that goes for the sitting president. Uh, the uh, uh, Obama budget of uh, uh, announced uh, uh, recently uh, ought to be seen as the Democratic offer uh, in a negotiation yet to happen. You know, I think we all uh, regret that the opportunity that uh, Simpson Bowles provided was not uh, seized upon by the administration. Uh, I think there's a great deal of regret that the work that Alice and Pete Domenici did was not seized upon by members of Congress or the administration. I think there was an effort to get back to it in the discussions the President and uh, Speaker Boehner had, but it was unfortunately unattainable. We are now, I think, in, in a dark period where we're not going to get realistic about bringing together the competing points of view. But I do think it has to happen immediately, beginning in November after the election. And I think those blueprints that are out there will ultimately serve as the basis upon which some agreement will come together. There really aren't a lot of other options when you really look at the things that are possible. Um, and so uh, I think all the good work that Alice and others have done in the last year will not be for naught. Well, I'm not going to give up on it, just because I, I still believe that if you actually put out a full plan, you kind of just made this point, Vic, it's very difficult to say, here's how I would cut four to six trillion dollars in spending if you have to actually say what you would do, or how I would do that all through raising revenues just on people making over a million or 250,000. When you have to fill in the details, I think it actually starts to forge that uh, compromise, because it's very hard to do it on the two ends of the spectrum. But we shall see. I still think it would be a really interesting debate. Maybe it would be a, a short and empty one. Um, to switch to the points that all of you also touched upon, the importance of the long term. And that really is the big theme here of uh, 
the problems that our country faces and the potential solutions that really have to look at what's driving the problem. Healthcare costs, the largest one. The aging of the population, a huge contributor. Um, and Vic, you recognized uh, for the progressive perspective, which is sometimes harder to recognize, Social Security, Medicare reform have to be on the table. Uh, everybody's talking about the need for a comprehensive plan that looks at everything from tax reform to cuts in spending. But entitlement reform has to be a big part of this. Um, but it is difficult to have that reflected in the numbers. And I think one of the things in our report, we focus on the savings in, in actually less than the first decade. How do we focus this overall discussion on longer term savings? And I think Alice, particularly somebody who's been in charge of the scoring institutions for this country, how do we help focus that if you get the longer term spending or um, fiscal problems under control, it actually can buy us some more breathing room in the shorter term where we're still trying to have the economic recovery take hold. Is there a way to focus attention on that, since we all know that's kind of the key problem? I hope so, but it hasn't happened. Uh, the theme that seems to me to be missing from all of these budget uh, discussions is the timing. Uh, we don't need to balance the budget tomorrow. Uh, if we did, uh, it would be a catastrophe for the economy, and we're beginning to see in Europe uh, the adverse effects of extreme austerity uh, in, the, in the short run. What we do need to do is get back on a sustainable track, and that mainly means, as we've said several times already, uh, reining in the entitlement so they're not driving up federal spending faster than the economy can grow, and finding more revenue, hopefully by a reformed uh, tax code. And the impact of those major changes won't hurt people in the beginning, because you don't want to raise taxes right away or uh, uh, cut entitlements right away. Uh, they will take effect over a longer period. And you have to do the scoring for the second decade, for beyond the 10-year yeah. window. Uh, now, that's always very uncertain, but it's not that uncertain. Uh, the idea that you can't do it, of course you can. You have to make some realistic assumptions and then uh, and then do it. Uh, but it's uh, quite uh, possible, and it's irresponsible not to think about what happens in the second decade if we don't make changes now, uh, especially in the entitlements, because it takes a long time to phase them in. One of the things that I think progressives need to focus on is the degree to which debt service is increasingly crowding out other forms of spending which often go to the least among us, to children. We have, unfortunately, without addressing entitlement reform, an inexorable intergenerational transfer. More money going to older people, less money available to go to children, to the most uh, needy among us. That is, I think, the inevitable result of making no policy changes in the entitlement area and not reining in the debt, which, of course, increasingly costs us annually additional billions of dollars. So I, I hope that progressives could see that that is an important value that they need to hold high as they enter into this debate and ultimately compromise that I think we need to reach on a bipartisan basis. I talked about the long term a bit uh, in my discussions. We do need uh, targets for the long term. And uh, as we uh, work toward through a decade, we need to have uh, enforcement mechanisms that uh, if we do not reach the targets for debt and deficit in each year, there is some kind of a penalty or some kind of a sequester or whatever it takes uh, that the Congress uh, has to accept or, uh, or to override. And uh, I think that is wonderful to help us get into the debt stability. I think Social Security and programs that are that long, we do have a pretty good idea what the long-term outlook is. And, and that's a matter of mathematics or political negotiation. It, uh, it is not hard to do. You simply have to decide how you want to do it. Uh, but I think more importantly is to set those long-term goals and targets and have some kind of an enforcement mechanism uh, to help you get there. 
They won't guarantee you'll get there, but uh, they will help. I think it's all really important, and I think um, we will issue uh, our next report, or one of our next reports, both looking at the long term, and I think that's right, Bill, on the budget enforcement mechanisms that would be part of any plan, because we know that the longer out you're making promises, the harder it is to know whether they're going to stick, and to have a plan for how they might stick would be uh, particularly useful in, in making them more credible. Um, I'd like to open up uh, to the audience for questions. There should be microphones somewhere, I'm hoping. So uh, if anybody has a question, just shoot their hand up. There's one here in the front. If you'd please identify yourself um, and then speak into the microphone so C-SPAN audience and others can hear. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Jim Moody. I served with several of these people on the panel. Uh, <laughs> um, back to Alice's point about the long term. Obviously, we know it from your how counterproductive it is to try to reach budget balance in the short term when you're in the recession. But in the long term, what is the ultimate optimal deficit? It certainly isn't zero. I look at the deficit as a form of foreign international trade in a sense. We're providing a real service, store of value to the rest of the world. They're parking the money here. They're accepting a very low uh, net in rate for that. Uh, we're providing a real store of value. They're lending us money. The question is, what is the balance within that? It should not be zero. The balanced budget, a zero deficit is not a good idea because that takes away liquidity that we are very, very uh, helpful for us. So is there some sense in which we need to sort of set a long-term goal of what is the optimum deficit side? It certainly is not zero because it's for the trade and balance of, of value that, we're, that it provides. And it's a great question for this group because all three of these panelists are members of the Peterson Pew Commission on Budget Reform where we spent hours and hours in a room, that's how much fun we have, uh, discussing topics just like that. So where you all fall in and what we should be shooting for ultimately. Alice. Well, uh, my answer to that question is implicit in what I said about the increase in the debt. Uh, we should uh, not have a deficit uh, that is uh, uh, more than 2 or 3 percent of our GDP because we can't grow the GDP much faster than that. Uh, and uh, we need, uh, I'm not alarmed about current deficits. Uh, we're in a deep hole. Uh, we had a deep recession. Uh, we need uh, uh, to do the things that uh, will get us out of uh, this recession, and uh, we need to keep, uh, keep on doing them until we uh, recover. Uh, but uh, uh, over the cycle, we need to come closer to balance, not at balance. Uh, and uh, over the long run, uh, you just don't want a deficit that's growing your debt faster than your GDP can grow. Yeah, I, my opinion is that uh, in, in normal times, we should balance our budget and not have a deficit. Uh, the target of the Peterson Pew Commission was to uh, take the debt to 60 percent of the uh, GDP uh, by uh, in a decade or maybe slightly more, uh, <coughs> and then try to work that debt ratio down to what uh, we might consider to be the post-war average. 40 plus percent, something like that. And if you could uh, maintain a debt level like that or lower, then you're well suited for emergencies in the future. And as a follow up on your question, Jim, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that it's a great idea that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, poorer countries uh, ought to be financing us. I think uh, I'd like to see us financing ourselves and, uh, and them to use their money in improving uh, their own many needs in their own countries. You, you lump China into that poorest country category? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and just to, to mention Not a couple poorest, things. poorest, but poor. It's one of the things that we discussed when we were um, debating this issue, discussing this issue on the, on the 
Peterson Pew Commission was, I think Bill really emphasized this, that it's almost two steps. You want to get it so that your debt's not growing faster than the economy, but then you also want to get your debt back down to lower levels, closer to the historical average. Part of the critical reason of that, of course, is that why we were able to respond to the past recession was that our debt levels, even though our deficits were a little higher than we would have liked, our debt levels were low, and we were able to borrow an awful lot of money. There'll be disagreement about whether it was the right thing or not to do, but you certainly want that fiscal flexibility when you're hit with whether it's an economic downturn or any other crisis from the outside. And right now, we don't have that because of where our debt levels are. So it's not just getting so that it's not growing faster than the economy again. You've got to bring it back down to a level where you have that flexibility. One idea that we had that I always liked was that every president who, when they put their budget out, it's a 10-year budget. You don't usually expect that all of those out years will happen because they'll put out another budget. Um, but it is a, a good target to have a president who has to offer a budget that balances over that entire 10-year period because that's reflective of what's a normal business cycle term. So it would be, you know, you could run deficits if the economy were weak, but you would expect to have a plan to repay it over time. That seems like a reasonable approach. Um, there was a question right here from Jim. Um, yeah. Wait, if you wait for the mic so okay. we can hear you on C-SPAN. Right. Thank you. But uh, I wanted to ask about uh, about Medicare and premium support. I know Alice has her own plan. First, a technical question. Uh, when the candidates here evaluated for their support of the Ryan plan, I wondered, I assume it's the first plan, not the new one uh, with Wyden, which is slightly different. And I wanted to ask Alice and the others, um, whether you, obviously Alice believes that premium support is the best way to approach reform. Do you see, no, uh, well, I'll ask you, is it the best? And do you see any support for anything like what you proposed, what Ryan proposes, or any other scheme that would help to reduce the cost? When I say, when you say premium support is the best, um, that doesn't reflect uh, actually uh, what, um, uh, I uh, believe, I think we don't know. Uh, and the proposal that uh, former Senator Pete Domenici and I uh, made uh, is the following, uh, that we keep traditional Medicare and we keep the efforts that we now have uh, in the Affordable Care Act uh, to bend the cost curve by trying to figure out what are the uh, most efficient ways uh, to spend money on health care and, uh, and introduce new incentives into Medicare. But that we also uh, uh, take advantage of the idea of uh, competition on a uh, federally uh, set up exchange uh, and uh, set up an exchange on which uh, seniors could, if they wanted to, uh, choose among uh, plans uh, that would cover the same benefits as, uh, uh, as Medicare and would compete uh, for their business. Uh, and they could choose uh, the traditional Medicare if they uh, wanted to. Uh, but the, uh, the important idea here is that the federal government's contribution uh, would be defined uh, over time uh, and would be capped uh, at a reasonable uh, rate of, uh, of increase. Now that's a very long answer, but it avoids the simplistic notion that you said premium support is the best thing. Uh, I think we don't know whether competition or regulation will be most effective uh, in bending the cost curve and we need to give seniors uh, the chance to choose. Um, I'll just jump in and, and say that one thing that I think is really encouraging is that all the candidates have talked about the need for longer term Medicare reforms um, and embracing the Paul Ryan Medicare premium support plan. Um, I believe that's right, Jim, that that is the first version of it. But what we've also been seeing is different versions of that coming out. So Alice and Pete have um, the, the proposal that keeps traditional Medicare there. There's now a bipartisan bill with Senator Wyand and, and Paul Ryan. And a lot of these candidates... Yeah, which is very similar. 
which is very similar, exactly. Um, and so this discussion is moving forward with premium support at part of it. The one candidate who's actually been more specific on this is uh, Senator Santorum, who has talked about actually bringing in some of these cost controls early on, so they are captured as well, and he's been more specific on his support for premium support. Um, so we're, we're starting to see that discussion both on the campaign trail and outside in the public discourse. But, but the question was uh, whether uh, you see support developing for either of those uh, notions, and uh, perhaps some of you see it in the, in the Congress, I don't. Well, the, I, the candidates, I if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, in all of the Republican candidates uh, said something positive about uh, Ryan Wyden, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Whether or not this is, again, in this black period during an election a time that you're going to get Democrats to step up and endorse this is unlikely. But I do think it, it based on the work that Alice and Pete did, that these two bipartisan senators have picked up on, there is a way to the future on this issue. But I think we also have to look at delivery, how we deliver health care. We have to incentivize changes in that regard. And the best place to start with that is with the SRG and start to reward physicians and other providers based on their willingness to be involved in bending the cost curve and getting IT and group practice and a lot of other things involved which uh, is something that many of our providers have been loath to do. Well, health care reform will be the gift that will continue to keep on giving, because if there's one thing we know, it's that we won't get it all done the first round. And so we will continue to have to struggle with health care reform in this country for years and years to come. Um, it does feel to me, though, that it's an issue that's percolating and is going to get discussed um, pretty richly during the campaign, which will help us to move forward on needed reforms over time, is my prediction. Uh, Lori, up here in the front. Where did that mic oh, great. Yeah, I had a question about the idea that tax cuts pay for themselves, because it's making something of a resurgence lately. We heard a lot about it from the Republicans during the super committee process. Um, yesterday, Glenn Hubbard on a conference call representing the Romney campaign said that they could offer to cut the tax rates by an additional 20% because, you know, tax cuts are going to pay for themselves. There'll be all this extra economic activity and, you know, the deficit will be fine. So I'm wondering, can we in the fourth estate summarily dismiss this idea or how should we think about it? Mic, Please, here, everyone's going to have to. Uh, I think there's no evidence that tax cuts pay for themselves. Uh, when you think about how much faster the economy would have to grow uh, to make up for the revenue of any given uh, tax uh, cut, uh, you realize that's that's unrealistic and. Uh, I'm surprised that Glenn Hubbard actually said that. Uh, the, uh, what's true is you can show uh, that cutting taxes, especially from very high rates, can be helpful in uh, increasing economic growth. Uh, but if that's all you're doing, uh, and you're uh, making the deficit larger, even though the economy is growing, uh, you have to say, well, what what else happens? Uh, do, do we make the deficit larger? Does that put upward pressure on interest rates? And does that negate any uh, gain that you might get from uh, marginally increasing the economic growth by cutting uh, taxes. And that's basically where the CBO is on scoring. Uh, they uh, don't, uh, they refuse to say, uh, to score an individual tax cut uh, as uh, uh, growing the economy uh, without thinking about what else happens. Uh, they'll score a whole budget proposal uh, and give some credit for tax cuts, but some non-credit uh, for raising interest rates or cutting certain kinds of spending to make up the difference. There's, I think Alice is, is dead right. There's an awful lot of things going on out there in the economy. And it is really hard to, uh, for somebody to isolate the particular effects of a particular tax cut. I think all of us who... Uh, who like low taxes, would like to believe in supply-side uh, formulations that uh, we will get uh, 
a great deal of revenue kick out of cutting taxes. But I think we have to rely, at least I believe I have to rely, on the estimates of the Joint Committee and CBO, who are doing the best job they can of, uh, of uh, the information that's available to them. Uh, so I, I don't believe uh, tax cuts uh, probably develop uh, as much as some of the sponsors uh, believe they do, uh, and that uh, certainly the uh, largest of them uh, are unlikely to pay for themselves. In uh, my view, it's wishful thinking uh, translated into political policy. And, you know, I, I look at the fact that the revenues at the moment are 15.4 percent of GDP. And even uh, Mr. Romney says he wants to bring government spending down to 20 percent of GDP. Well, shouldn't we focus on the 4.6 percent gap that even he would admit needs to be filled by revenues instead of talking about new tax cuts, which in the current context are just uh, ephemeral. Right, but I would just clarify that the, the main reason that revenues are at the level they are right now is still um, a hangover from the economic recession and that current projections, even if you extend the tax cuts, are that revenues would grow very significantly as a share of the economy without making any changes. So you have to look at the difference between structural um, deficits and, and where you are in the cycle. I think, um, Lori, it's clear that you can say tax cuts don't pay for themselves. But we have entered a period where people are looking at more fundamental overhauls of the tax cut. And I think this discussion was started in earnest by the proposal um, made by the two big commissions. Um, the the Bowles Simpson Commission talked about broadening the tax base dramatically and bringing rates down dramatically. And then you can buy back some of those tax expenditures. When you're talking about rate reductions as low as these new reforms are talking about, certainly the result, result <coughs> will be economic growth. And then there are a lot of other variables. One of the other variables is how much will that add to the deficit, which right now is probably likely to dampen economic growth, just like a debt deal over time would help grow the economy as well. Um, and then all the other factors that are going on. So the problem is not that it's unfair to say there would be some growth from cutting tax rates. It's really getting those specific estimates. But when you're talking to somebody like a Glenn Hubbard or a serious economist on this, um, my sense is that you can actually take what they're, how they're discussing and framing it quite seriously, that there is a legitimate claim that it would grow the economy. Um, but that's different than that it would pay for itself in terms of how much is cap for, captured by the federal government. Right there. Oh, sorry, Phil. My, I just had a question of clarification for your description of Romney's um, the uh, impact on the deficit. You you described it as being deficit neutral. I just wanted to clarify that's deficit neutral um, with respect to the committee's baseline scenario. That so is actually debt rises under that. So I'm not sure that it's. It's exactly a neutral scenario. Well, deficit neutral is compared to a baseline. And so the better question is exactly which baseline, because anybody who is uh, steeped in this stuff or even a, a little bit exposed to it knows that the world of budgeting baselines is one of the more confusing ones. And whenever you're talking about saving something, it's always a question of compared to what. Um, and the Romney campaign hasn't told us what it's deficit neutral compared to. We're assuming it's the same kind of baseline that we use, because they know they're assuming that the tax cuts would be extended which is the same starting point that we assume, because that seems to be the most likely proposal uh, people are comparing to now, and other patches to AMT, SGR, and things like that. But yes, the scenarios have the debt rising, which is why we tend to look at this metric as debt as a share of GDP, and whether it would be growing faster or not there. And under these proposals, uh, it will be growing and then starting to come back down. So that's, that's the sort of, compared to what question, we'll still have to figure out exactly how they're looking at, but our assumption is just as you said. Uh, thank you. I, I'm uh, Phil Joyce from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. I, I'm much less concerned about the candidates not getting specific about what they will do than I am about them getting very specific about what they will not do mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is not ultimately helpful to getting our way out of this, you know, getting out of this problem. So I'm interested in whether people on the panel uh, are worried about this and sort of how worried about it we should be and whether there's anything that can be done about it. Panelists? I'm very worried about it. 
Uh, but particularly on the tax side, I think uh, taking uh, a pledge that says, uh, I will never raise taxes, uh, especially if it means I will never raise revenues as opposed to tax rates, uh, I, uh, I think that's a very dubious and unhelpful uh, kind of pledge uh, to make because, as I said earlier, I think it is totally unrealistic that we can stabilize the debt over the long term uh, without both uh, uh, increases in revenues and uh, reductions uh, in entitlements. I'd be equally worried uh, by a candidate who said, I will never cut uh, your uh, the Medicare program or uh, Social Security benefits, uh, but uh, we don't hear that from the Republican side. Uh, same, same response. It, it, it is very dangerous if uh, if candidates pledge never to cut entitlements or never to raise taxes. Uh, we're not going to get there if they stay in those positions. We hope they're opening bids, but. Uh, but it is a dangerous situation. And uh, Vic just uh, pointed out a uh, chap who would like to burn all those pledges, and uh, uh, I think we ought to build an altar to him in every church in town. <laughs> you know, it isn't just Grover Norquist who loves all the attention that he gets in every kind of forum like this, but it really is across the spectrum. And in primaries, uh, people are particularly vulnerable to wanting to pledge their fealty to one cause or another. Um, it can be the Club for Growth. It can be uh, a committee to protect and preserve Social Security and Medicare. There are all kinds of groups that circulate these things, and candidates feel um, compelled to pledge their loyalty to the cause. But when it all comes to a point of needing to break down these barriers and to find bridges, it's making it that much more difficult, and we all understand it. And yes, you know, we're, we're terribly worried about that. I guess the one encouraging thing is I do feel like the public understanding and awareness of this issue has increased and that it's it rings a little bit more hollow than it used to. Uh, we at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, we're always trying to discuss whether we can, um, you know, start a pledge to not take pledges, but we can't we can't climb our way to, out of that hypocrisy, so we don't pursue that. We, we see the irony in it. But, um, you know, you, you do at least get the sense that we're moving towards a place where candidates they know they have to govern. Nobody wants to back themselves into a corner as tough as the primary or the election is for them. Um, and so you can see them if you listen to them and when they're, they're trying to kind of keep a little bit of space. I think that the, the situation has changed where people are trying not to back themselves into a corner where they won't be able to govern because whoever takes office is going to have to at least get a start, if not completely, really turn the situation around. And uh, it's all the harder if they have made promises of what they won't do to get us there. Uh, we have time for one final question. Yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Crosby. I spent 27 years on the House Rules Committee. And uh, among other things, we, that's where a lot of the waivers of the Budget Act took place. And so I'd like to follow up on the question of budget process and budget enforcement mechanisms. Um, do any of you all have specific suggestions for budget enforcement mechanisms that might work better than some of the things we have tried to this point? I think we can devise uh, better mechanisms that, uh, that spotlight uh, the targets and uh, perhaps uh, shine more light on uh, on the Congress when it attempts to renege on its promises. But uh, we know uh, the first thing we're told when we go to Congress is that no Congress can bind a future Congress. And uh, if uh, future Congresses decide uh, that uh, previous promises uh, are no good, uh, they can certainly uh, Welsh on them. And, and do with some regularity. Uh, but uh, if, if they are made prominent, if the targets are well understood by the people, I think it will become more and more difficult uh, to Welsh. Also, you, you have to make the enforcement such that it isn't 
too stern. If, if you make the penalty uh, uh, too tough for not meeting the target, uh, then Congress can be expected to try to avoid it. And you also have to anticipate that there will be times when it's necessary to avoid it, a war, for instance. Uh, but, uh, but I think we can make them better, but there's no way to make them perfect. I would just say at this point, I'm more concerned about the fact that we have no budget process. We don't have an appropriations process that works. Uh, we simply have stopped doing even the reconciliation bills that used to be done periodically because somebody wanted to pass a tax cut with 51 percent of the Senate. Uh, I mean, we have let the whole process deteriorate to a point where the highly partisan and very toxic environment on the Hill has made it impossible to function even in the most basic ways, let alone impose uh, rules or regulations that would make it more difficult to avoid uh, taking a gimmick approach or waiving uh, something that, you know, we all ought to adhere to. So I think it's even more basic than your, your question. And I, I hope we can get in a new environment in the next Congress where we can at least let the process work as it was supposed to. I would take issue with your characterization of the uh, process rules of the past as uh, as totally not working. Uh, the the uh, issue, I think, is that they did work. The Budget uh, Enforcement Act had quite good rules that mostly worked, uh, give or take a few waivers toward the end of the period. Uh, but uh, and I expect that the caps on discretionary spending uh, will will work. Uh, because most of the Congress uh, wants them to. Uh, our problem is that although the old PAYGO rules worked pretty well, uh, the situation now is that the entitlement programs drive spending up even if you do nothing. So you really need a new set of rules that says uh, we're, we're not going to do anything that increases the debt. Uh, faster than a particular limit, and we just need to evolve what those rules are, and then, as my colleague said, a consensus that we want to enforce them, because nothing is going to happen unless we have that consensus. One of the, one of the recommendations we came up with here was the three T's, which were targets, triggers, and transparency. And the thinking was that when we start this process right now, we don't even lay out where the budget's trying to go. Uh, the budget process just doesn't even start with an ultimate objective. And so that's where we came up with this objective is to stabilize the debt, 60 percent of GDP, bring it back down afterwards. But set a benchmark or a metric for what you're trying to achieve, and then you put forward different proposals for how you'd get there and you can evaluate them. On the triggers piece, we've really seen that beginning in earnest. So we have the sequester right now. Um, it may or may not prove to be effective. One of our bigger concerns, of course, is that people are trying to get rid of the sequester, um, which would be very risky and, and quite possibly lead to another downgrade. But the real idea here is you have that, that sequester or that trigger. Nobody should want it to hit. It's a terrible way to do policy. And that helps to incentivize putting in place smarter policies to get to your targets or where you need to go. Um, and I do think that as the fiscal situation becomes more dire and people are less willing to talk about policies that would make it worse, those kinds of triggers have more of an effect. Um, and finally, transparency. One thing that we've seen when you look at other countries, one of the things that helps keep a country and their budget on track is if the public knows what you're trying to do and rallies around it and holds politicians accountable if they fail to do it. Um, that's one of the reasons that actually trying to balance your budget is so desirable because it's easy for people to understand. So when we talk about stabilizing the debt, it's a little more challenging. I, I, two years ago, I believe we had a party where we put stabilize the debt on a bunch of cookies to try to make it a bumper sticker. Um, I haven't seen those bumper stickers. It's not as catchy as one might like. But what you need is the public to know what you're trying to do and help hold politicians accountable. So uh, those are kinds of the pieces we've looked at. But I really think having these triggers, these default policies. If you don't make these changes, politicians, they're going to happen automatically, and that's not the best way to govern, and that's really turning over your power to automatic triggers. So hopefully that can help pressure politicians to come together and make those right choices. So with that, I would like to thank our wonderful panelists, Vic Fazio, Bill Frenzel, and Alice Rivlin. Thank you so much. Um, anyone who'd like to download the report, it is now available on crfb.org. Uh, and we please stay tuned. We will have future editions of U.S. Budget Watch. Thank you. <laughs>